Kensington said, well, we want you to write some novels. And I thought, oh, well, I've done screenplays before, so I can adapt that. That should be pretty easy. <laughs> and, I, and so I, and I thought, okay, well, I'll just bring you the stories of things I've already kind of written. And so, and they said, okay, that would be great. And I said, like, they have to be, I would like them to be about women, and I want them to be positive, and I'm not, you know, there's not gonna, you know, so is that okay? And he's like, yeah, that's fine. We have people who write all that other stuff. And I said, okay. So, and, and I said, I like, you know, I kind of write what I know, and, and I'm, I'm very much about families and people overcoming obstacles and, and trying to communicate and come together. And so that's, that's what these books are about. So they take place in a fictional town called Oliver's Well. That's based on a place that I, I've been to a lot in the, on the East Coast. And, and Oliver's Well is in Virginia. And it's a little town. And the first one that came out was called One Year. And it's one year in a family's, in a family's life. And it's, it's about three generations of women. And these two women marry into this family, and they have this very somewhat difficult mother-in-law. And she is sort of the matriarch of the family, and she's a little, she's a little tough, and very rigid and strict. And these women say, well, "How I got it? You know, we married these men that we love. How do we deal with her?" <laughs> <laughs> and so it's about them coming to terms and learning about each other and overcoming the generational issues and still like being women and you know uniting together and it's about forgiveness um, this one is the house on honeysuckle lane and the house on honeysuckle lane is, is takes place during christmas and it is it was just made into a hallmark christmas movie that was on last year with alicia witt and colin ferguson starring in it and um and yeah so that, so that was really fun so now it's actually called christmas on honeysuckle lane because in order to be a Hallmark Christmas movie, you have to have Christmas in the title. <laughs> so this is the original book. It's the same story, except now you can only, so I have hard covers of it. You can get it as Christmas on my the lane, but only in paperback. So, so that's, I have the original. And Honey Suckle Lane is the house that this family grew up in. And the, the dad passed away a bit ago, and then the three siblings um, have to deal with the loss of their mom. So um, one of them, one of the kids has sort of been holding down the fort and calls the other two and says, you have to come back and we have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So this one is sort of about attachments. It's sort of about the things that we, we think we're attached to emotionally, like physically, like, I want that tea set. I want grandma's tea set. Uh, I want that ring. I need that ring. Uh, it's sort of, and, but it's also about the emotional attachments and where you fall in line in the family. Like, are you, you know, being attached to like, oh, you're the youngest, or you know, I'm the oldest. And, and so it kind of go, it goes through their, their lives and how they deal with the loss of their parents and what the legacy is going to be moving forward and how as a family they can honor their parents' legacy and still, and still continue on with their lives. And what to do with the house and all of the items in it. So, so, that, so that, those are the three books. And so a lot of times people say, why did you, why did you write you know, your memoir? And for me, I feel like I've always been writing. I, it's one of the things that saved me when I was having trouble growing up on the show. And Lessons from the Mountain um, is really about all of my lessons. I don't throw anybody else under the bus. It's not about Judy's lessons or Eric's lessons. It's really about my lessons, my mistakes, things that I did along the way. And, and, and some difficult times that I had growing up on the show when I felt um, so inferior and I had a lot of body image issues and I was really frightened and I had never been an actress before I was on the show. So it was my very first audition and I was a dancer but I didn't really know that much about acting. So everybody else had worked before so it was my first job, my first audition and I was terrified to do something wrong and to ask for help. I just felt like I couldn't, I was supposed to know it, right? You're supposed to be a professional. And so there's a lot, a lot of different things in here about the stuff that I went through. There's funny uh, behind the scenes stories. And then in, the, in this version, the paperback, it does have a little update from every cast member. 
in the back. So they all kind of said, well, if you're going to write it, we're, we'll add to it. So it kind of says, everybody kind of sent me something to say what they're doing and what they're up to now. And um, and so and then it does it ends with it doesn't end with the show ending. It's like because the show we got canceled, and the way we found that out was in the newspaper. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, after spending over half my life on this show working for this company and this network, no one picked up the phone and said, "Oh, by the way, you're not coming to work this <laughs> this spring." Um, so that was hard because. I felt so, um, they were my family, and we didn't get to say goodbye. And we never had that, well, we had, but we're together all the time now. That's the other question. And we all get along really well, and we're all going to be together at the end of the month. They're opening up. Um, there's a bed and breakfast that is a um, model of the Walton House. And it's opening in Schuyler, Virginia, which is where Earl Hamner is from. And there's a museum there, and so there's this whole little Walton land in Schuyler, Virginia. And we're going for the grand opening of John and Olivia's. Oh. <laughs> At the end of the month, so we'll be at John and Olivia's. We see each other all the time. And then we're going to be in Altoona, Pennsylvania um, the first week in December doing an event together. So a lot of times people want to know, do you still talk to each other? Well, we do. I was on the phone with Eric yesterday. We text each other. We have a special WhatsApp that is just us, and it's called Wally's. And so we, we text each other, and, and so we are in constant contact. Um, one of the things that is, is interesting about, about writing this book is that it was so different than what I thought. So I had journaled a lot, and I had always written short stories, and, I, and then I, after the show was over, I had produced and had written and written scripts. And so, but when you go to write about your own life, it's, all, it's very vulnerable. And I went back and read a lot of my journals, my journaling. And, and it was really painful. It was like going, I, I stored all of these, these issues and these experiences in these like Tupperware containers. And they were way stored way back away. And they were, had all been burped and sealed for a very long time. <laughs> and so it was sort of like going in and opening up all of these containers of stuff and re-exploring it, but it was very healing. And the reason I wrote the book is because for most of my life, I, I was really scared. And I was just felt like I was dancing as fast as I could, and I was just gonna get caught. At any moment, they were gonna figure out that I was awful mm -hmm. and a fraud. And so, and I felt very alone, and, and I had an ulcer when I was 15, and I felt this incredible pressure to be perfect, to act perfect, to be perfect. We had to have good grades, or we couldn't have our work permits to continue working on the show. So, so at one point in my life, I was a cheerleader. I was on the volleyball team. I had a 4.0, and I was doing a television series nine months a year. And I just felt like I wasn't enough. So I wrote the book so that no one would ever feel the way I did, and that we would know that we're really not alone. And what I've learned since is that it's so true. I, have, was, I never was alone. I just never told anybody what was going on. And, and now there's, you know, I've had girls come up to me and read the book, and, and people have said, oh my gosh, I didn't know you felt that way. Even Richard Thomas said that to me. It's like, what? Why didn't you tell me what was going on? I said, you were busy. <laughs> You're a busy being John Boy. <laughs> so, and I really didn't tell anybody. And it was just, you know, keeping that secret and holding it in and trying to be perfect was damaging emotionally and physically in so many ways. The crazy diets that I did to try and fit in, literally, to my wardrobe. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was really, it was really tough at some moments, and I was in one person who saw how sad I was and how difficult it was for me was John Ritter. And he was playing Reverend Fordwick at the time. And he came up to me and he said, so, what's wrong? <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing's wrong. What do you mean? And he said, no, what's wrong? What's going on with you? And no one had ever said anything like that to me before. I said, what do you mean? No, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong. And he said, well, so what's wrong? <laughs> and I finally kind of opened up a little bit and started
started to talk to him, and he was the one who started me journaling. He said, I've been keeping a journal for years and years, and I suggest that you keep it private and just go get a journal and start writing. And that night, got one of those spiral you know, note, notebooks at the market, and I just started to pour my heart into it. And I was, I was blessed enough to get through it and to be able to see John before he died and tell him that he saved my life. So, yeah. Oh my gosh, it was, and, and, he, and he, you know, of course he's like, ah, he was just so great. He was just, he was just a lovely, lovely person. And so, so there's stories like that in here, you know, just some of the stuff and the fun too. Because, you know, literally when I was 10 years old, I was taken out of my Vendetta family and taken somewhere into some crazy place and plopped down with this other family. And I didn't see my own family. I only saw these new family people <laughs> that I'd never really known before. And we were together, you know, for the next 11 years. And they are my family, so I'm very lucky that I have this second fabulous family. And, um, and I got to know my own family later. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're working, you know, when you're working nine hours a day, and then you have an, at least an hour drive back and forth to the studio, you know, you're not home as much. And we were all, all, all always together. And then when we weren't working, we were publicizing the show, doing parades and, you know, opening of envelopes, everything. <laughs> We were together then too, and so and so it, there, was a, there was a lot of fun times that we had in the show, and it's it, it's such a gift. And you know, I'm always surprised when I've done other TV shows after the show finished that that people on other TV shows didn't have lunch together. I was like, where's everybody having lunch? And they would all run away, <laughs> get in their cars, and go. Like, That's so strange. They don't have lunch. So I'm going to read to you one of the um, one of the little stories because people often ask about the dinner table scene. <laughs> so this is something called um, lessons in laughter. Almost as famous as the good nights were our dinner table scenes. From the family scrambling to their seats and saying grace to the cold food we had to eat right after lunch usually. Uh, you can watch us whirling peas or some other unappetizing pile around our plates if you watch closely. <laughs> we spent so many hours at that wooden table. Every episode had at least one dinner table scene in it, and they were the focus of our time together on the set. We were all there every single time. So there are many dinner table stories, and they all still bring a smile to my face. They, or sometimes they even make me laugh out loud. I can still hear Will rambling on, often unscripted, as he had a tendency to do. He would, you know, when he was saying the prayer and he would start thanking the trailing Arbutus, we smiled and we knew that another long dinner scene had begun. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually because Will didn't know his lines. Right, so he would go, and Lord, the trailing Arbutus would be like, there we go. So on, on every show that I've ever worked on, there's always uh, at least one set that's very tough for one reason or another. Either the energy drops or the types of scenes that are played at that seat at that set are really demanding or they take an especially long time to shoot. So for us, it was the kitchen, specifically the dinner table scenes. If we were in the kitchen shooting a scene, it was pretty much fine. But the minute we all sat down for that meal, we knew we were in for it. We spent so many hours at that dinner table. We would get punchy sometimes and a bit slap happy. And we often sat in the same, same places. And my spot was right between Michael Learned and John Wamsey, so Jason and Mama. So one particular day, the energy level was especially low. And to relieve the boredom, Ralph started singing in a staccato voice. I shot the sheriff, but I did not shoot the deputy. <laughs> now, Ralph, he was 
not a singer that I knew of. <laughs> and his rendition of the Eric Clapton song was so out of tune and horribly inflected that he already had us all in stitches. We burst out laughing. And eventually, when we calmed down, we suddenly had the energy to refocus and continue working. So for years, Ralph would try and crack us up by singing that song every time the energy got low. And his great sense of humor was perfectly timed, so it would just lighten us up and we could move on. Ralph made those long scenes easier to bear, but sometimes a little harder too. I always got in trouble for getting the giggles from time to time. And right before a take, Ralph would lean in and whisper something off the wall or poke Michael or you know, nudge her underneath the table just to get a rise out of her. Well, she was the consummate professional. So once the camera rolled, she would be focused and be the perfect Olivia. But I did not have that kind of control. I was 10 when I started, right? So, and it was usually during grace. And I sat right next to Michael, and she would squeeze my hand, and I knew she was laughing. Now, to keep her from breaking character, she would squeeze, and I'd feel it get tighter and tighter, and then I would feel her arm shaking <laughs> next to mine, up against my arm, and I knew she was laughing inside, and then I couldn't help myself. So I never wanted to keep a straight face. Um, whatever, that was part of the fun of it to me. I would start giggling, and then I would ruin the scene. <laughs> Cut! And I always felt awful, but I laughed anyway because I just couldn't help myself. And when we were really out of control, usually a stern look from Grandma at the end of the table <laughs> would keep us in line. Although there were times I would sneak a peek down to the grandparent end of the table and I would see Ellen laughing and slapping Will in the arm. <laughs> so there were hijinks at the other end of the table too. Ralph also had a habit of repeating the same jokes over and over again. So eventually, all he had to do was say the punchline, and we would crack up. Our favorite, our favorite one was he would put up a hand, and he would lean in, and, and, and with that twinkle and that those blue eyes of his, he'd lean in and he'd yell, not so fast, person! And it was a joke from like five years before, and we were just still burst out laughing. And it resulted in a lot of laughter, a little confusion for some of our guest stars. <laughs> but whenever this happened, new directors would totally lose control of the scene. And as we relive this moment from Walton history, we were so bonded because of the time we spent together. I spent more time at that dinner table eating than I did with my own family. And it got naughty sometimes too. I heard more dirty jokes around that table than my parents would ever have had a heart for. <laughs> Some kids learn things in the back alleys or the streets or on the schoolyard. Well, I learned them from the crew on the set and at the Walton Dining Room table. <laughs> I didn't know what a lot of the jokes meant, but I laughed anyway. And then I tried to figure them out later. <laughs> As I grew up, I got the off-color jokes the crew made, ears, made an earshot of us kids a little bit more. And as naughty as I knew it was, I felt like I was part of this secret club, and I was trying to figure out all the codes and the secret signs. Keeping it a secret from my parents gave me an even deeper sense of belonging. I knew my dad would blow a gasket if he heard half the things that I'd been exposed to. And years later, my mother admitted that uh, she guessed what was going on, and said, I know a lot happened to you, but I, I just didn't want to know it. I said, well, Mom, don't worry. I, I told her, I said, I would never tell you because you would have a heart attack and die. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, besides, I turned out okay. It was all, it all turned out okay. So yes, the dinner scenes were a wild ride, a joyful combination of acting, shoving coagulated food around our heads, <laughs> and getting through the scene without falling behind schedule. There was always a professional standard on the show, one I'm proud to have learned from Richard, Ralph, Michael, Ellen, and Will. They set a high bar, but somehow at that kitchen table, all bets were off as they taught us that even when you work really, really hard, there's always time for laughter. Oh. <laughs> and I believe this is That's always my favorite one to read. And when I had a, a book, my only book signing in Los Angeles, 
It was at a place called Book Soup, and Ralph came. He drove from Palm Springs, oh. and he showed up. And when I was reading that, he he, he started singing. I oh. shot the chair. <laughs> So that's that. Um, does anybody have, how are we on time? But I should look fast. Uh, we have some time. Okay. At least 30 minutes. So, and then I have some more books, and I can always tell you how to get onto my website later, and then we can take pictures or selfies or whatever later, and you can get more books. I'll sign them afterwards at the end. And um, if you do get pictures, it, just put them on the comments page on my Facebook, and I'll just move them over. You know, things like, Ha ha, we were there, you weren't. <laughs> Here's Mary in Dallas. Um, so yeah, so whatever you whatever you want to put in, and then I'll just, I usually move them over to the to the main feed. But I like to let people know what I'm doing. And my Facebook page, sometimes I post recipes. Um, I always post where we're gonna be and what's happening. Um, my page is pretty neutral. I acknowledge all kinds of people, all faiths and all holidays, and that bothers some people, but they just have to deal. And, <laughs> and, um, and but it's not, it's not political, and it's just very, it's very much like, I made peach jam. I, I used to live in Colorado before I moved here, and so I got Palisade peaches, and I made peach jam. So I post pictures of me canning my peach jam. And just, Silly things. Yeah. I have a cicada on there now. And I said, I think this must be in the summer because the cicadas are gone at my house and I post some pictures. You're like, what is that? <laughs> so then other people come on and say, it's a cicada. Look here. And they post the Wikipedia page. So it's educational too. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? You can ask about the books, about me, about the show, anything. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah. We're in Texas. And we're in Texas, so I'm in Irving. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And why did you move to Yes. That's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my husband's job. So because I, I mean, I actually, when Christmas on Honeysuckle Lane was made, I'm actually in it, too. I play the mom in the flashbacks, right? Or something. And type. Um, so I, I'm in it as well. So I, but I don't really pursue acting so much anymore. So I kind of, we had, um, I, when I got together with my husband, we blended our families, and um, I kind of decided that it was more important for me to be at home with our girls, trying to maneuver what was happening, that they were teenage, they were becoming teenagers, and and I, what was the, 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 the moment when I knew was I would be, I would drive up, because I, I moved to Orange County, because that's where my husband lived and he grew up and he had a job down there, and I, had, I didn't have a real job. <laughs> so I became scullery, a scullery maid, and a taxi service. <laughs> and I would get a call from my agent saying, hey, we have this commercial audition for you tomorrow night. It's in Santa Monica at 5.30. Huh. I was like, 5.30 on a Friday? And rush hour traffic in Los Angeles? <laughs> <laughs> and I would look, and I would look, and I would see, and I'd be making dinner, making soup or something, and I would look over at our girls doing their homework, and I would say, you know what? I'm making soup. <laughs> it just seemed, you know, and then the, the biggest one was my agent calls me, and I, I was sort of started to turn them down, I don't you know, know why, and because it wasn't like any big gigantic parts were coming up, right, that I always had to go and audition for them, so my agent said, you have to go, and it was like a Thursday night, and it was just, you have to get up to LA now, you have to go, you have to be there by, by 3.30, between 3.30 and 4 o'clock. And they just, you know, so there are going to be signs when you get there. And those are the things that have the scene on them. So it's just so fast. I said, I have to pick up kids at school. Like, we've got to go. You, the, the director wants to see you. The casting director is sending you. It's like the producers are going to go. So when you go in for producers, it's always a much bigger deal, right? So I find someone to pick up my kids. I get in the car. I drive up there. There's no parking. It's completely crowded. It took me two hours to get there. 
and I, I go in, and they, I said, where are the sides? And they said, oh, well, there aren't any sides. You're just going to do an improv. I'm like, an improv? What? Yeah, well, we're just going to film you doing an improv. I said, well, what is it about? And he's like, well, we'll just tell you when, when you get in there. So I go in there, and it's sort of like this. There's a camera, and there's this little like, <laughs> And I go in, and they said, OK, so I want you to pretend like somebody hit you in the head with a frying pan, and then you're dead. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> I put it down, 
you have to write, and you have to do it and say ping in exactly the same way, and it's called matching. So because Ellen was a script supervisor and she wrote down everything they did, she taught us how to match. So if we drank our milk on a certain line, she made sure that we knew that we had to drink milk. So then I stopped drinking milk. <laughs> and I started to butter my bread a lot. <laughs> or I would come up and go. <laughs> and then when they were on me about my weight all the time, I stopped eating completely. Because <laughs> you just can't eat. Because if you do it in the one in the master shot, you have to do it in all the close-ups. So you have to keep eating. But Ellen was great. And, and when, I, when I when I started directing um, and writing, it, it was so helpful to have that because matching is so important. And just to have it become like a second nature thing was really great, so she was wonderful. And Will was just like Grandpa, but more crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, okay, so Bonnie Claire, who's from here? You know, do you know that she's been, there's a church that she bought here in Dallas, which I don't know where it is, do you know where it is, Rick? Uh, I don't know, I don't know, I want to show you. Oh, okay. She was eccentric and very out there. She wasn't as um, like prim, but she w she was you know she was pretty pointed sometimes. A Ronnie Claire Edwards who played Corvette. She didn't have that shrill voice, you know, as nice she was. She wasn't like that, but. Uh, but she was she was really funny, and I used to call her Ms. Claire. <laughs> Ms. Claire. And she was always in agony all the time. And she and Michael would be in agony together. So we, one year for Christmas, I gave out these awards to everybody, and I gave Ronnie Claire the Ennui Award. <laughs> <laughs> she was there. She was always oh, agonizing, agony, agony. <laughs> but she said something to me once, and. One of those things along the way where when you're a kid, things hit you, or for me, because I am really sensitive, things hit me really hard. And then because I never asked anybody any questions about what they might have meant, mm -hmm. I figured, well, that must be something wrong with me. I better go change it. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie Claire told me once that, because I, I started taking acting classes, and she was like, oh, honey, you don't need to take acting classes. You don't need to act. You're pretty. Oh. And I, I was so offended. Really? Well, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's, and you know, but she was a character actor, so I guess for her, looking at me, you know, and I remember we, at that same Christmas party when I, we were giving out all these awards, um, one of our producers sang um, Thanks for the Memories, but changed all the lyrics and made little special things for each person. And, and they said, and Ronnie Claire's lips and Mary Beth's hips. Well, that's what me into total. <laughs> Instead of just asking, because I thought, well, hips are bad, so he's saying I'm fat. So I immediately started another yo-yo diet and tried because, well, he, he said that it must be a bad thing because nobody said, oh, hips. No, that's a, that's a beautiful. That's a woman. That's a natural thing. But. So I completely took it to heart and figured that I, I must get rid of those hips because he wouldn't have joked about it in front of everybody. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I have two. Okay. Um, and one, so I'll ask them both in the middle of the segue. So the first is you had no acting experience. Mm -hmm. So had you done a lot of acting calls for tryouts, or how did you get there for this one? And have the children, who are now young adults, all seen the Waltons. What do they think of you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. So I'll start with the acting thing. So somehow, because I was performing and doing, you know, ballet and tap and wine and jazz, and I think actually when I look back on it, I probably had, you know, ADHD because <laughs> my, my parents just put me in all these classes, right? Because I was always, I would never say, never stop moving. And so they thought if they gave me these dance classes or something, it might help. And um, and so <clears throat> I I had this sense, and I kind of would write like little stories, and we would get the neighbor kids together and put them on. So somehow I kind of knew that. But when I got the script, um, 
we had an, I had an agent who kind of was like, well, she's got to memorize this, and she's playing this part. And the, it, my very first audition was for the homecoming. And we read that walnut cracking scene with John Boy in the, in the barn. And so we went in there and did it. And every time we came back, I was with a different group of kids. And they just narrowed it down, because they saw everybody in town. Everybody. And so they just narrowed it down and narrowed it down. And then the last time we went in, it was just, it was us. And we met Richard Thomas. Mm -hmm. And they told us about Patricia Neal, that she'd be playing her mother, and that she had had strokes, and we had to be very careful with her, because I would be know What's that mean? We didn't know anything, but they told us about that, and we met Richard. And then, so then I sort of, like, you know, learned as fast as I could how to memorize the lines, and luckily I didn't have very many. <laughs> the only thing that I auditioned for, oh, a couple of things. I did a couple little little auditions, and I did a little tiny like a pilot thing with Jose Ferrer, um, but it was never on TV. And um, the only thing I actually got close on was The Exorcist. So yeah, so they yeah I know. I they were they were looking in New York. I know right. So I've done the homecoming, but they hadn't decided to make it a series yet because it was just supposed to be a movie. So I had done the, I had done the homecoming, and then uh, and so then they were they were on they were looking for this the girl everywhere, and of course they found Blair in New York, but they also came to California. So do you want to hear the story? Yeah. <laughs> so my mom like so I, my mom was like, well, what what is this thing? What what is it? And they said it was a very popular book. You know, it's just it's just coming out, and you know, and so um, I got down to this final again all these good callbacks to this final seven girls in California. And our agent calls my mom and says, so at the audition, the writer's going to be there, and, like, and um, they're going to bring in a hypnotist from UCLA. And my mother's like, what? Yeah, well, you know, it's a very intense story, so they might, they're thinking that they might want to use Something so the actress doesn't, you know, just to, to calm down and like not to, and they wouldn't say what it was. My mom said, no, no, we're not, we're not going. And then um, the agent said, oh, you have to go. She's never going to get it. They're looking at so many people. She's never going to get this. It's never going to happen. And you can't not go because then they won't like you and you can't, you can't ever say no to anybody, right? And so my mom's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't feel comfortable about this. So then my, my dad and I went out to get the book. And um, and so we kept saying they <coughs> Exodus. Well, we had that. We're like no, exorcist, <laughs> not Exodus. I'm like no exorcist. So we got the book and we brought it home. And my mother read it in one night. Uh -oh. And I remember waking up and she was just white. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going. She's not doing this. She's not doing this. And the agent said. She's never going to get it. It's going to be fine. They're just going to go and do little exercises and meet these girls. Just like, don't even worry about it. She's like, I do. So my mom requested to talk anonymously to the hypnotist from UCLA. And so he called her and he said, I don't want to know which one is your kid, but I just also want you to know you're the only parent who has wanted to talk to me about what I'm doing to your kids this afternoon. <laughs> he said, I think that's really interesting. <laughs> yep. So, um, so I obviously I went in the hot. That's a whole other thing. It's in the book, but um, that's a whole other thing. They they tried to get us to you know, and we all were faking it and pretending. And, and um, but I I I made the guy mad because he told me that I couldn't do something, and I said I, I can't. And he said, Oh, really? Try it. You're not going to be able to. You know, so I needed to try the whole thing. So I and I did it, and then they. I should be right out the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going to be her. Right? And then months later, the, the, the Waltons became a television series. So I feel very lucky that it all worked out that way. Yeah. Although I love Linda Blair. She's a dear friend, and she's a really, really great person. And But I'm just glad that wasn't me. Um, <laughs> and then the other part of it was my family. My family is not allowed to watch the show. They have been banned. Oh, I'll tell you why. So my husband had never seen an episode. Actually, I don't even think he's actually seen the whole episode to this day. So he, no, he watched every show that was on against us. And I met him. I'm like, 
Let me see. Did you like? Did you like Mod Squad? Oh, I love that show. I was like, oh, what about you know Buck Rogers? Oh, that was a great show too. Did you watch Flip Wilson? Yes, I love Flip Wilson. I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Every show that was on against us, my husband loved. So. So when I met him, he did, didn't really have a reference of what the show was. And then I was a single mom for 10 years before I met him. So my daughter just kept hearing about these Walton people. And we would go to Virginia. And we would go, like we're going in October, we would go to Schuyler and there's the, you know, the museum, the community center. So my daughter thought the Waltons were all of the fan club members. <laughs> you know, because we were going Waltons, right? Is Waltons? <laughs> So she thought that that's what the Waltons was. And, um, and so she never really saw an episode either. Mm -hmm. And then when I got together with my husband, they decided that it would be a really funny thing to watch an episode. It would just be great. So they started to watch an episode. I think it was the family when, like, where's Elizabeth? I don't know. And then Judy and I, Mary Ellen and I, are in the car with Daddy. We pull up to Ike. Have you seen Elizabeth? Oh, she went down there, right there. Right? So, oh, let's go. Right? So that's kind of how my, my family portrays the whole episode. And they do stuff like this. Wait, who am I? <laughs>
And apparently, I didn't, I didn't say we watched the Americans. Yeah, he, he, apparently he was really great on it. Was he really a writer? <laughs> um, no, but Earl Hamner, who he played, did really write, he, he is John Boy. So Earl Hamner is John Boy, and he wrote about his real life family. And that's, that's they're from Schuyler, Virginia. So that's, when you go there now, the, the bed and breakfast, John and Livia's is opening, the old school where Earl Hamner went to school, which is right across the street from the house where they all lived. And there were eight of them. We have, no, there were seven kids, and we have six. They cut on with them, Jim Bob. Um, and, so, and then there's, um, the Hamner house is there, and you can tour it. And then there's a little general store, and then the high school is a community center, but it's also like a museum. You know, they have props and things that we've given them over time and scripts and things. So it's really kind of cool. But it's but when you see this tiny house where they all like four girls in one room, you know, and there's one bathroom. Oh mm -hmm. that was kind of Yes. Mm -hmm. So speaking of John Boy, what was it like when you found out that they had to recast that character? Oh, or Oh, oh, it was the biggest mistake. That's our that was our jumping the shark. <laughs> and and Robert, Robert, he's he's a really really nice guy, but it was just the worst mistake. But what happened was, Richard wanted to leave the show, and you know Earl wouldn't kill anybody who was alive in real life. So like at one point they're like, should we just kill? The, he's like, no, 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 my mother is still alive. No, because when Michael left the show. He's like, no, no, my mother is still alive. That's not happening. And of course, he was still alive then. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, it's like, we're not going to kill John Boy off. So they brought him back. As, it was just, that was, that was not great for us. <laughs> <laughs> or the show, I think. Mm -hmm. Is that not <laughs> No, I know. You were doing single camera thing for, for doing the shit. And I mean, you had a lot of cuts in, in, in every scene. Did you ever do any AD? Or was it always? That's why those dinner scenes took forever. How, how long was your shoot? Was it eight days? It was seven. You, it was like um, it was eight days when we started, and then as we got better, they they realized that we could save money. They could do it in seven and a half days, and then it became like I think we ended up at like six and a half days for an episode. We had a second camera on big crowd scenes and stuff, but not at the dinner table. So they did a master, and then. They would do like breaking shots, or if you had points, they would do the close-ups, and they, they would always go in and do Ralph and Michael first, because they were there, and the camera was always here. And then, you know, 10 hours later, they would come around and do the sides of the table, or, you know. So you, you wouldn't have anybody like leave and then do the other sides, or? No, or some. would stay for the... Oh yeah, and they would bring us in. I mean, sometimes they let us stay in school if we didn't have very many lines. But no, they would pull us out, you know, that was always, we, we were always there. And that was the great, um, the, the great lessons that we learned from Richard Ralph and Michael Wills, always to be there for other actors and, and just to, to be present and to stay. Yeah, because a lot of times, I've done shows where they let the stars go home and you're doing your lines to like an X. Mm -hmm. and, and then script supervisor is just reading the lines and you're looking at an X and pretending like it was an actor in their home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had, so we went to school three hours a day, we had one hour for lunch, and we could be there for nine hours total. Mm -hmm. So that's why they worked us a lot in the summer. So we worked all summer, and the only time we had off was like from like February, March, or like, you know, March, April, and part of May. I was never on the set for my birthday, mm -hmm. and my birthday's May 4th. So we would come back right after that, and then we would do all of the kid-heavy episodes in the summer because we didn't have to go to school. But I remember sitting in the schoolroom and be doing a crying scene, and I'm trying to do algebra. And I know I have to go back into the set and cry, but I'm trying to do math. And it was like, oh. so yeah, <laughs> right. And I and I wasn't I'm not one of those people who could just cry like that. I have to get into it and think about it and do it. So it was it was always pretty challenging, you know, to just jump back and forth. How long How long were you on the were you on the water lot for the interiors and then you were, how much location were you doing like for an average episode? 
When we first started, we were up in Fraser Park a lot, and then they just did a bunch of stock shots, and then we just laid them in. And then, um, then we shot in Franklin Canyon, which is a canyon. It's the canyon where Andy Griffith and they throw the rock, and that's a res that's a that's a Los Angeles reservoir. We had to get permission to throw that one rock in that water. And then we shot a lot of the stuff. And Six Million Dollar Man did all the running stuff up there in those pine trees. And then the reservoirs also were like Paul Northridge proposed to Aaron, you know. And, and so we used, we used that a lot because it was cheaper than going up to a great again. But they, and then, funny enough, you know, Warner Brothers is in Burbank. And there's a hill, these kind of hills that go over, if you've ever been there, into Hollywood. And so they literally did pans from that in Burbank Hill down onto down. I know, right? And there's wires and stuff. It's also near the Burbank Airport. So a lot of times, you know, we have you know whole you know, gag reels where just like airplanes are flying over. <laughs> so we didn't have any jets then, so we had to do it. Yes. Any more books being written? Yes. I um, I am writing a a fourth book, not in the Oliver's Well series. It's it's something completely different, and it's either I can't decide what to do to do with it yet. But it's a story about a, a a girl who loses her mom, and it's called right now the working title is In My Mother's Footsteps. So it's about a girl who tries to figure out who her mom was, and she kind of like follows this path that her mom did. And it's been a long time coming, though. I came up with the idea like 25 years ago, wow. and I just haven't had time to do it. And I, I don't know if it's going to be three short ones or one gigantic one, but I'm just working on it. Doesn't sound like a Hallmark Christmas movie. No, <laughs> no. no but Hallmark has the rights to make one year into a movie, but I don't think they're going to do it. And I think it's a perfect one for Christmas on Honeysuckle Lane. Did anybody see it? Yeah. So I think it's perfect to have them come back and do a sequel where they actually get married on Caro's their anniversary, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Palmer. <laughs> so you told us your children kind of, you know, joke about your time on the law Yeah. How do they feel about your writing career? <laughs> you know, I don't even know. So here's another thing. None of them have read any of my books. Oh. My husband has not read my books. Oh, good. He only, you know, I take that back. He has to read, he insists on reading my acknowledgement to him. Oh. <laughs> but he, that's, the, that's the only part. But if it's something about him, he, he wants to know about it. But other than that, no. And we joke about it. Like, what point is it? Like, yeah, really. You really should read my book, and, and you know. But it was funny. It, Patricia Neal, um, I, 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 I tried you know many different elements of the industry, and I, I started writing, and I, I wrote this screenplay, and I did a short, and it went, and I put it in film festivals, and so I, I cast Patricia Neal, and it was like a four generation of family thing. So Alexander Paul from Baywatch played the daughter. Um, the mother was Michael Learned, and the grandmother was Patricia Neal. You can get it on my website. I think you can order it to watch it. It's, and it's a 17-minute short, and it's called For the Love of May. And so I wrote it and adapted it as this little short to kind of be like a teaser to try and, try and get it made. And Patricia would always, I would ask her things like, okay, so Gary Cooper, tell me. It's just there. It's in the book. <laughs> so now I'm finding myself being like Patricia. Yeah. Oh, you want to know that about me? It's in the book. <laughs> I don't have to talk about anything. It's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you ever done live theater? Yes. Yes. So I, my life is kind of about going backwards. So I had never, I, you know, usually people do theater. And then they work their way into film and television. Well, I started out in television, and then I started doing theater afterwards. Um, when I started taking acting classes when I was, you know, like 15, or because I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. And then I did theater. And I actually did my first play, it was with Johnny Crawford and the Rifleman. 
And Patrick Wayne, there was a three-person play, and I spent four months in Amarillo, Texas at the Country Squire <laughs> Dinner Theater. Wow. 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 Doing a play called the Angel on My Shoulder. So I, I lived in Texas before. <laughs> Briefly. Yes. With yeah, the summer. Like, yeah, well, no, it was snowing, my God. Oh, no. It was freezing. And it was after Easter, and I'm like, but this is Texas. It's supposed to be hot, right? And it was snow on the ground. So, yeah, so that's that was um, in my time. Now, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah. okay. So, we have about 20 minutes left. Now, we can continue to do, because um, I didn't know we have a lot of questions still. We can do that for the rest of the time, or we can split it up where we do some some one-on-one, -on -one, you know, selfies and stuff, or um, what do you think? What do you want to do? Do you feel like you have enough questions answered? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, no, it's in the book. It's in the book. <laughs> Okay, here's some more books. Okay, I'll 